Okay, James, we talked in the first part that you've you've decided to give up the uh, well, racing, basically, for a bit. Yeah, yeah. And you've decided to be to become a lawyer. So you've gone to university. Uh, what's happened next? Uh, yes, yeah, so luckily, to be fair, when I was 16, 17, I hated school. Uh, but my mum was like, you need to, need to keep going. So luckily, I might not have gone very much, but I did get my A-levels. So it did mean I could go straight to university. When I retired, I disappeared, went travelling for, for a few months. Uh, came back, went to, went to uni. I enjoyed doing a law degree. I found it pretty easy. Um, I was quite lucky I got a, a first class degree, which was good. And um, the law industry is quite hard to get a job. So like you apply two to three years in advance before you start work to try and get a job. Um, so I worked hard, I managed to, to get a job as a lawyer, uh, and then you had to do a postgrad, and that is more the day-to-day -day of what a lawyer does, and it's quite um, ultimately boring. Uh, it's very much minor details, minor contracts, um, what you see in the TV, as a solicitor especially, it's more the, um, the office work you do, you don't do much much court work. and. I really struggled when I actually started being a lawyer, sitting in an office from nine till nine in the evening, long hours. But whereas I could work long hours here in, in the yard, you're always doing something. You're never in one place. And yeah, just working in an office, it just really wasn't for me. And um, probably being spoiled. Racing's a hard, hard life, but it doesn't feel like work most of the time in the fact that you're choosing to do it and you enjoy it. So I think I was very, very lucky that uh, I had like the options to, to do something else. Uh, a lot of people have to work a, a nine till five job. And I think I'm very fortunate that I had the choice, but yeah, ultimately it wasn't for me. I just, just hated it. Okay, so you came back to your dad and said- uh, So initially I went more just down the broadcasting route. Um, but this year um, we kind of had, a, a, slight short staff dad wasn't very well i think back in may so i came back um, nothing serious but he just had to have a, a quite a few weeks and we needed help and i've enjoyed coming back so i tend to do monday to friday in, in the yard uh riding out driving the box helping with entries just just doing whatever's needs doing and then drive back to leeds to work for william hill at the weekends so it's uh still quite intense but keeping busy so what is what is your have you got a title in the yard are you assistant trainer again now uh so my brother's head lad so it's a real family business my mum runs the office dad's obviously trains uh title yeah i suppose assistant trainer but it's kind of do a bit of everything really okay so a lot of people now know you from william hill radio and also the, uh, racing tv how much work goes into the study for, for those appearances? You just turn up and ad lib it or do you have to really get your end of the uh, Very much, it depends on, on what you're doing and how many meetings you're doing. Um, naturally, being in the industry at, at the races, racing TV is constantly on. Uh, as a yard, you have to know what's going on. So every day you're looking at the results, watching the race and knowing what's happening. Um, if I'm on track, um, because you, you've not got a laptop in front of you, you've got to do a lot more prep work, especially I find with the young horses in maidens and novices, because you need to know the background, pedigrees, trainers' records in that kind of contest, uh, what you think on paper the horse is going to be like. They might be very, very different when you see them in the flesh and, and see them countering down to the start. I think it's very important to watch back the past videos because um, you need to see what's happened in the previous races. You can just, just flick through the in-running comments, but you might spot something that perhaps they haven't noticed. Um, yeah, I think you, you need to do quite a bit of work, but I'm quite lucky. Uh, probably if, like, from my law background, I've got a pretty good memory. So if I look at something once, it tends to be stored in my head. So I don't actually have to do do too much. So I've got like a very, very good memory. Not quite photographic, but like I could remember every single kind of colors of the horses that I rode once I've seen it once. I kind of be able to know what that horse is, what trip it runs over, who trains it, etc. So I'm quite lucky in that aspect. Okay, commentating is one that you've not tried yet. Ah, uh, too boring for that. <laughs> no hope. No, um, obviously, with, with especially with William Radio, you go race to race all afternoon, all night yep. sometimes. Is there a lot of pressure knowing that some of your listeners, viewers, are going to be following up your advice, bet, betting with their own cash? Is, is there extra pressure on you knowing that? Not particularly. 
uh, people aren't forced to, to to follow your information. Uh, I always try to be honest, accurate, whether it's about our horses or other people's horses, what I think will win. Um, but especially when we're doing every single race, it's quite hard because um, I don't bet particularly much myself, but I wouldn't be betting in every single contest. And, and you've got to give a, a good valued opinion on, on each race. Um, some races are good betting opportunities, others aren't. But I might say, people aren't forced to bet. So hopefully they like what I say. Um, I think as long as you're providing like a reasoned analysis, then whether, obviously you want them to win, but as long as what you're kind of saying is relatively accurate, I think that's probably more important. Okay, and you mentioned not much of a punter, but you are a punter to a certain extent. Yeah, like very small stakes. I don't particularly like losing money. Um, if I've got time to really have a good look and you, and you see an angle where uh, there might not be much pace on or there's a particular, uh, I think we've got a lot of grass tracks where there's a bias where you don't want to be on, on that part of the track and sometimes you can see horses that are racing on that part of the track. Next time out, they finish seventh or eighth and the race and the results say it's been a real disappointing run and actually it hasn't been. I think if you put those horses in your tracker, etc., they'll pop up and they'll be overpriced because a lot of people haven't noticed it and there's a big recency bias when people are pricing up races or judging races and sometimes there's, there's totally valid excuses for why said horse ran below par and you can kind of get a bit of value but uh, like I say since I've come back home my time for watching every single race uh, to have a bet in has definitely diminished. Does all the work you do make you more compelled to have a bet you would you obviously you're going to look for every race do you think oh that's that's a, you know that's a, if you have to watch yourself and not, not uh, get too involved not yeah not particularly um yeah it's there if i think one's got a chance i might have a like five or ten on it but it's not a definitely not not big big bet and it certainly wouldn't uh pay my uh living to put it that way right would you get more involved obviously in your own yard you know about the well-being of a horse. You know it's fit. You know, you know, you know it's fancied or whatever. Would you be? More yeah, definitely. Kind of Obviously, around? you can tell if a horse is running into into peak form. Um, unfortunately, they're not machines, and I'd love to say X will win today and uh, pay my mortgage off. But unfortunately, that it doesn't work like that. And it's always interesting. You go to the races. There's probably four or five in each race. They all think today's today's their day. Um, just hope that. You get the best out of your horses, best for your owners. Um, it's funny with, with horses, you have, owners have differing um, objectives of, of having a racehorse in training. Some want to have a horse to go to local meetings that are nearby. The races might not be the most suitable races for the horse, but they'd rather have a, a good day out at a local track rather than pinpointing a really bad race at, say, Seville or heading up north for, for one of the smaller tracks. They're not really interested in that. So... Um, I'd say I'm kind of more when helping dad plan the races it's trying to find what the owner wants everyone wants winners but some owners would much rather a winner at a local track or even just a runner at a local track rather than a winner at some of the tracks far away and, and slightly lower grade races yeah so you wouldn't describe yourselves as a gambling yard you don't know, ban the ban the stable lads from knowing the names of the horses yeah no <laughs> definitely not um, it's it's interesting I think racing People kind of have the rose tinted glasses, I suppose, of perhaps gambles in the 60s, 70s. There are still some yards that you'll see duck egg, duck egg, duck egg, the prime for that day. But um, I, I definitely wouldn't be be one of those. Okay, and another thing that you are involved in is bloodstock. You, you buy and sell via the yard, is that how it works? Yeah, so that would be more uh, dad and mum. So Betty's Hope, who won the Super Sprint this year for us, um, and mum actually picked her house. For just three thousand pound at Ascot Sales, which is actually coming up around about this time uh, this year, um, we've been very lucky. She ended up winning. She's won one hundred and forty-five thousand already. Um, but Dad is probably quite unique in, in one of the smaller yards in that we actually buy most of our horses ourselves at, at, uh, at the yearling sales. Dad likes to have new horses into the yard and, and start afresh. We get probably fifty-fifty of owner breeders that send us young horses, and Dad will go to sales and. Um, buy probably six or seven yearlings each year uh i probably try to get more involved with that in time i think this year thanks to betty she's won uh, like that prize when it means we're probably going to have a few more horses so a racing club that we 
used to have when I was riding. We're going to try and get that back going again. And me and Patrick, um, are probably going to syndicate a couple of horses into smaller shares just to try and get new owners back into the yard. But yeah, with the bloodstock, um, Dad's Dad's very good at finding horses. Like nearly every year, for relatively cheap money. We don't have big budgets like um, the big yards have, but he always tends to come home with something pretty decent. In recent years, Daddy's girl, she only cost I think five thousand. She's won five times, rated 96, I think, at a peak. She's won 75,000. Um, I say I think we're quite unique in that we're able to buy young horses to bring them along steadily, whereas a lot of probably yards our size tend to buy older horses out of the bigger yards where they've had all their education. They haven't been good enough in, in the big yard, but they've excelled in a smaller yard, whereas I think we're very good at actually starting from scratch. And I say I think if we ever had your big investment we'd be able to, to train him as well as any other big yard so he's obviously got an eye your dad has, has he imparted that knowledge to you is it something you can teach somebody um you can kind of point things out a lot of it is intuition i think um like i say i would be more what i see in the page of the breed and what i if it's an older horse the form book etc whereas dad's doesn't particularly look at that he's more of the physique of the horse and especially when you are dealing with our budget you ain't going to be able to buy a pedigree because if you're only spending fifteen or twenty thousand, that's a that's a, a big budget for us. That doesn't get you a very well bred individual. So he just looks more at the physique, more at the confirmation. He wants to buy a sound racehorse that can hopefully run quite a lot and hopefully might be quite good. Okay, now just one thing I want to ask you before we finish this part: the gambling industry has been under a lot of pressure recently. You know, people complaining about sponsorships. Um, that sort of thing. You've got, obviously got no qualms working for a bookmaker via William Hill Radio. What's your opinion on bookmaker, trainer, jockey sort of sponsorships, that sort of thing? Yeah, it's an interesting one because obviously um, people think there's that hint of perhaps um, connections telling bookmakers and, and gaining that extra inside, inside information as such. But what tends to be produced is very much in the public domain anyway. There's no secrets uh, anyone's hiding anything from um ultimately racing at the moment it'd be lovely if you had all these blue chip sponsors that wanted to come into the game and you had all these real famous names which unfortunately isn't happening the bookies are our main foundation and um that isn't going to change anytime soon so i think you need to kind of embrace that and betting is the way our sport's currently funded and you need to try and get as much money into the sport as possible. So you, I think parties need to work together. It is a tricky one. Um, like I say, it'd be lovely for racing to try and get outside sponsors, but it's very hard to do that. I was speaking to some, um, somebody recently and they were saying that the outside, the big sponsors don't want to get involved now because of the bit of a stigma you know, with, around the gambling that's involved yeah. in horse racing. It's, it's interesting because of all the equestrian disciplines, racing is the only one that really has any money involved in it um show jumping when i was very young and, and back in probably the 70s 80s that used to be prime time tv very very famous whereas i would struggle to name apart from the skeletons more from their racing involvement or the olympic olympic show jumpers that doesn't exist in, in the public consciousness we've kind of uh, moved on from there and if we didn't have the funding from the bookmakers unfortunately racing would diminish even more um, that's probably a fair point. Some sponsors might not be, want to be associated with that, but um, there's still also a fair bit, not just for betting. Um, you've got Royal Ascot, Social Occasion, etc., etc., which you can also be promoting the day. Gambling is a big part of racing, but it's not everything. People do like the horses, love the horses, and love the social day out. So there are things to be built on, I think. 